uh, Diana Driscoll here, who's with us this evening, to give a talk on the Golden Road to Samarkand. Um, we're very happy to have this series of lectures and for such very eminent people to come and lecture to us um, about the Embroidered Tales and Woven Dreams exhibition, which I hope many of you have seen. Um, the lecture, Golden Road to Samarkand, is about the Silk Road cities of Samarkand and Bukhara. And they will focus on the external architecture of these two cities, developed from sun-dried brick buildings, I love the alliteration, to the fantastic tile work which we'll see on the outside and inside of these buildings. Um, what, why they were built, who built them, and why have they survived to this day? I'll leave, I'll ask Diana to explain all this to you and just carry on with the next bit. Um, Diana read her degree at SOAS, all the best people do, um, BA in Akkadian and Hebrew, ancient Middle East with special subjects in history, religion, and languages. My God. I know, I think that's <laughs> What could you have been Long thinking? Long time ago. <laughs> what could you have been thinking about? and later an um, MA in the History, Art, and Architecture of Islam. She was Deputy Direct Registrar at SOAS from 1980 to 1992, and then moved to a post as Director of Education for the British Council in Hong Kong. I cheer British Council on having such good taste. Um, it was here that she discovered the Silk Road and made many journeys into China, which com complemented her travels and studies in the Middle East, India, and Iran. She is now an independent researcher in the Asia Department of the British Museum and volunteers and with, uh, uh, with her talks and lectures on special subjects of the Silk Road, and we have stolen her for this evening. She covers 3,000 years of history and almost 7,000 miles of trade from Morocco to China. Don't you ever stop. <laughs> Besides giving regular gallery talks on the Silk Road at the BM, she is a lecturer for the Royal Academy, Cox and Kings, art tours, and regularly accompanies groups to Uzbekistan, Morocco, Mughal India, and Iran. So without further ado, may I request you to put your hands together for Diana Driscoll. <laughs> right, thank you, Marion. Sounds like a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> well, if you live long enough, you've got a longer CV, let's face it. Um, I'm very thrilled to be here tonight because uh, Marion had another speaker who unfortunately had to leave and go back to the States for a visit. And so this lecture is dedicated to her and her husband who passed away just last August. And I hope I do them proud because they are very much Silk Road travelers. Now Marion has the most exquisite exhibition we saw upstairs. And this is only a third of her collection, a third. And she started collecting from the early age of 14. She didn't even realize she was a collector. She just started accumulating things. And the wonderful thing about the exhibition is on the walls of the exhibition there are some murals. And in the murals, we see people, buildings, merchants. There's a caravan. There's a souk. There's a mosque. There's a madrasa. And this is what I'd like to talk about now, is the beautiful clothing she's collected to talk about the buildings that are in the murals behind. So the next time you go up to that exhibition, look at the walls. The Silk Road. Now, many of us know about the Silk Road. We've heard about it for centuries now. And it is the great, great roads, network of roads, the first global highway. Globalization started in the first century BC and it's not going to discontinue next week, Mr. Trump. We started it off in Xi'an, in China, and it went all the way to Byzantium, to Rome, to Greece, down into India, up into Siberia. And on this Silk Road, there were caravans. Everybody loves a caravan. 
everybody wants to be on a camel. And these caravans that went all the way through these various sort of 5,000 miles of road from Xi'an to uh, Rome carried commodities. And this lovely lady on your left is a Tang Dynasty doll. And she lives in the Met. And she's wearing wonderful, wonderful fabrics from Uzbekistan. She's wearing silks. She's wearing woven fabrics. She's wearing pearls from the Persian Gulf. There's porcelain, there's, there are spices, there are tangibles and intangibles that were, what went on the Silk Road. But where the Silk Road actually started and where it went to was through a very, very difficult area. It was an area that was dangerous. It was risk takers. The merchants who were there were not your everyday people. They were people who had to know languages along the way. They had to be able to negotiate who's going to protect the caravans. Here is an aerial view of what is in the north. To the north of the Silk Road was the Eurasian steppe, the steppe lands. And the steppe lands were vast, vast bands of grassland, very much like the American prairies or the Argentinian grasslands, and they were to the north. That's the purple section you see. Above that is the Siberian forests, and that's where the furs came from. But underneath that purple area is some yellow spaces, and those are the great deserts that go from Xi'an all the way to Uzbekistan and beyond, the Central Asia. And these four deserts were the Gobi, the Taklamakan, the Kizilkum, and the Karolkum. And the inhabitants of the steppe land were also nomadic peoples, and they were horsemen. And these horsemen were known by various names. And they were filled with um, they were either protecting the caravans or sometimes they were attacking the caravans. And they didn't have actually very good press by the Greeks and the Romans and the Chinese and the Persians. They didn't quite like the people of the steppe, these great horsemen. And the great steppe peoples, some of them were known as Scythians or Huns or Turks or Mongolians. All these peoples lived in the steppe lands. They spoke different languages, and they had, and their names have resonated during the centuries. Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, that spread terror in the peoples of the pastoral cities below. And let us not forget that some of them were women, women warriors, such as Queen Tomris, who supposedly was a Scythian queen and took out Cyrus the Great. And here we have a wonderful 15th century manuscript of Tamaris. And she's putting Cyrus's head in a vat of 15th century French Bordeaux. <laughs> but I'd like you to note the tile work in the background. She is in front of some wonderful tiles. So here we're going to now head into where the, the steppe land to the uh, cities themselves. So where the steppe meets the desert were these vast oases. And these gradually, these oases became settled. And they became larger, they became wealthier, and they formed a series of trails that went from the Mediterranean, through Iran, through India to China. And the noblest of these cities was in Uzbekistan. Because Uzbekistan was the center, the heart of the Silk Road Trail and it was in Central Asia. Uzbekistan, excessively hot in summer, pleasant spring and autumn. Climatically, it's a challenged area. The glaciers of the high Pamirs and the Hindu Kush and the Tian Shan Mountains feed two great rivers. And the great rivers we know from the Greeks are called the Oxus and the Jaktars. And there's also two great deserts further west, the Karakum and the Kizilkum. And many people have traveled through these areas through the centuries. 
and we're going to meet a few of them today. And the first one we're going to look at is someone that you may know about. And his name is Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, with his troops, had to traverse through across the Oxus River, which looks very big in this picture, but it's just almost a stream today, unfortunately. But Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great came to a city called Afrosiab. And he said, everything I've heard about this beauty, the beauty of this city is indeed true except it is much more beautiful than I imagined. He even married a princess named Roxana. And we think this probably was inhabited by a group of people called Sogdians. Now, you may never have heard of a Sogdian. Don't worry. Many of us never did. Because it's only been in the last 50 years, thanks to the work of Nicholas and Ursula Sims Williams, who have given us insight into who are these people called Sogdians. Now here we have on this, this overhead, the city of Afrosiab, probably reconstructed highly, but that's all right. It did have ramparts, it had a center, it had temples, it had buildings. It was filled with merchants. Here's another city not very far away called Panjikent, which is a citadel a little bit later. Panjikent is also occupied by a group of people called Sogdians. And these Sogdians were the first middlemen of the Silk Road. We first heard about them probably about the first century BC, first century AD. They sort of come out of the mists of history. Little footprints though had been left all over the place. Footprints in China, in the Taklamakan Desert, into Uzbekistan. They were sort of, they were never an empire. They were a group of city-states, very much like the Venetian city-states. And as suddenly as we found out about them, they disappeared because the Arabs who came in 722. But in Panjikent, Archaeologists have, have unearthed some of the aristocratic houses. And there's wonderful frescoes on the walls of these houses, brightly colored, fantastic groups of people. We're finding, archaeologists are finding more and more um, letters and tablets that refer to the Sogdians. They were basically, they were basically accountants. And they were the middlemen of the Silk Road. One of the Chinese uh, chroniclers tells us what he thinks about the Sogdians. And this is what he said. All the inhabitants of Samarkand are brought up to be traders. Mothers give their infants sugar to eat and put paste on the palms of their hands in the hope that when they, they are grown, they will talk sweetly and their precious objects will stick to their hands. <laughs> These people are skillful merchants. When a boy reaches the age of five, they begin to teach him to read and to write and to be able to study business. He's never permitted out of Samarkand or Panjikent or other places until they're 20. And then they're ready with at least four or five languages each to be the merchants. So as a result, these merchants were highly cultivated and they wore wonderful, wonderful fabrics just as Marion has collected. I don't think she has any of the Sogdian fabrics, but here they are sitting at a banquet. Look at their hairstyles, look at their beards, look at what they're wearing, look at what they're sitting on, look at all these wonderful things that tell us about the Sogdians. And who were they? Where did they come from? Well, we don't know. But on the walls of their, of their homes, we have these fabulous murals. And here we have visitors coming on their camels. And they're sitting on wonderful camel cloth in fantastic woven fabrics. And they're wearing jewels. They're wearing pearls from the Persian Gulf. And they're wearing silks and satins from China. 
But the one thing about the Sogdians we do know is that they were religiously tolerant. And so we have Zoroastrians and their historian Christians, Judaism, Manichaeism, Buddhism, and finally Islam came. So the Sogdians knew which side of the, knew very much what they were doing. They were into wealth and their god was money. They did try to oppose the Arabs for almost 100 years, and finally they lost. And they have sort of disappeared, as I said. But Samarkand as a city that sort of started with the Sogdians sort of reemerged after um, a couple hundred years. We do know about it from about the 14th century through two rather famous um, writers. One of them was a Moroccan, Ibn Battuta, who traveled all the way from Morocco to China. And he said that is one of the largest and most beautiful cities in the world. And of course, there's our Venetian merchant, Marco Polo. And he even bounced through here also. But what we really know about Samarkand is through Amor Timur. And this is the man himself. Timur in the 14th century has transformed this city into one of the great cities of the Silk Road. He was a nomadic chieftain. Um, he was of Turkic, probably Mongol ancestry. And there's no doubt, there's no doubt that he had aspiration to be a world leader of a world empire. And he wanted to follow in the footsteps of Genghis Khan. But he was not a Mongolian. But what he wanted to do is, for street credibility, he married Mon Mongolian princesses. He married not one, he married four. That's what you call making sure all your options are covered. He wanted to make sure that the people who followed him knew that he was part of the noble lineage. And he called himself a Guregan, a royal son-in-law. But his name, the title he took was Amir, which is basically a warlord. He never took the title of Khan. I think he probably wanted that to be given to him. Anyway, from the age of 25 to his death at 70, he transforms the whole army of his tribes. His small tribe has now become a huge army. And they're all beholden to him. And they overrun, on numerous occasions, a landmass equal to that of Genghis Khan. The great cities of Persia, Syria, Egypt, Asia Minor, India, and even Russia fell at an alarming rate. And because of this, he brought, coerced, uh, uh, enslaved artists and artists and ar artisans from all these cities to bring them to his country. And the first place that he lived when he was uh, as a nomadic warrior was here in these wonderful tents. And you'll notice the wonderful fabrics on these tents and how people are dressed in beautiful fabrics. He knew how to live. He knew how to be entertained. He wanted to be cultured. He wanted also to show the world that he was appointed by God on earth to be the leader. And so he built a palace and his palace is now very close to Samarkand and is called the Aksarai. And this is his first building. And what he wanted to do, he wanted to let people know that his monumental personality was also as monumental as his buildings. And this is his palace, his first building, built in about 1379. And it's unparalleled in size and in decoration. The towers alone, those towers, look at the people below, they're teeny. The towers are 215 feet high. The arch, 130 feet. The span of that arch was 30 feet wide. And what you're looking at is a brick building. Eastern Islamic architecture are brick buildings. They don't build in stone. It's brick. And what you do with brick, you can decorate it. And you can decorate brick with tiles. 
and that's what he did. Large surfaces can be covered with bricks that are glazed. They can be glazed on one side, and they can form zigzag patterns, and that's what we see going up those great towers. Zigzag patterns, one side of the brick is glazed. It's protecting the building. It's using color, and it's using the dusty color of the brick complementing each other as an art form. The other sort of tiles he, he was developed about this time was smaller tiles, sort of like bricks about 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters, and there's one tile, and they would have an outline in that tile, and it's sort of a greasy substance. And they, because they were afraid that all the different pigments, when they glazed them, would melt together, so they separated them with this sort of inky substance called manganese. And when they fired these, they didn't melt together. Second form of tile. The third form of tile that he develops is called mosaic tiles. It's like a puzzle. When you fire a tile, it shrinks. And so what they wanted to do was make huge pictures of puzzles with their tiles. So we would do a whole batch of blue, a whole batch of, batch of turquoise, a whole batch of white, and then you'd cut them. And you'd put them together like a puzzle. And that is called mosaic tiles. And also on this building, he used another type of tile, which was a, a really deep lapis lazuli background, and on it he put gold leaf. Magnificent. A Spanish envoy named Roy Gonzalez de Clavejo came to Timor's court in about um, 14, no, 1398, and he stayed about four or five years. And he must have done nothing except write about the glamour, the glamour and the courts of Timor. And he wrote about this building, and he said, the walls were paneled with gold and blue tiles. The ceiling was entirely covered with gold work. Room upon room upon room of marvelous tile work, chambers, banqueting halls, gardens, and pools. A brick building of extraordinary beauty, and all set within a huge garden, because Timor loved his gardens. Matter of fact, in Samarkand alone, there are eight gardens that we know of. None of them exist today. Hesh, this was where he was born. Unfortunately, this not, it was not going to be his capital. He needed to build a capital. So he moves on to Samarkand, and he brings all his artists with him, and he's going to build the biggest most spectacular, colossal capital in the known world. And so it was. Five miles of walls, six different gates going in, and the names of the gates reflected his uh, captured cities. We have Damascus and Cairo and Delhi, etc. He brings here in this manuscript that we found the John Hopkins, this fantastic manuscript, and there we are building building Samarkand, and we go back to Clavejo, and Clavejo tells us that Timur's palaces were hung with fine silks and tapestries, verdant gardens, eight that we know of, had wild drinky parties, and a party was not good unless everyone got pissed as a newt. He demolished streets, and we built them within 20 days. And he said the tumult was such that it seemed as if all the devils in hell were working here. And here we have in this manuscript the city being built. We have our elephants bringing marble. We have tile cutters. We have mosaic color tile makers. We have the, in the right hand, the left hand corner, the man with the red, with the stick, he's the man who's beating everybody to get their work done. We have woodworkers, tile workers, cement mixers. Everybody in these manuscripts looks different. Every face is different. 
Every piece of clothing is different. So he's showing us all his artists and artisans from around the captured world. And there they are. And so the city swelled with theologians, historians, scholars, architects, masons, painters, calligraphers, bookmakers, tile glazers, silk weavers, glass blowers, silversmiths, goldsmiths, and armors. And Timur personally, personally overlooked all the architecture. And if anybody said it couldn't be done, off with their head. He built this fantastic mosque, the Bibi Khanum Mosque, probably one of the largest buildings in Samarkand today. It is the largest building. Timur wanted a mosque like no other. So he had the best slave artisans, the best potters, the best of everything. 95 elephants came from India to bring the marble. Just look at this building. It is like, it's like an ocean liner. It's massive. And not only is it a massive building, because the mosque is over there on the right. It's the entry that's on the left. And all you need in a mosque is one minaret for call to prayer. But now we have eight minarets. The minaret has now become a piece of decorative art. It has become part of the building. It's not only minarets and tiles, but we now have domes, wonderful domes rising up. And under the domes, there are these drums. The towers themselves before this building looks just like his palace, the Ark Sarai. Do we get it? A little bit of a palace, mosque, God, I'm doing it. The towers here on each side, 115 feet high. The arch, 60 feet wide. Eight minarets, 160 feet high. And as you walk through this entry hall, on your right and left are these amazing tiles. A brick building, with tiles and the colors, white, turquoise blue, and cobalt blue, predominantly timid colors. A little bit of green, a little bit of yellow to complement. But that's a timid color palette. Double domes with high domes going higher and higher. And that's what he wanted. He wanted by the time you got to the mosque, you went through that main door into this great courtyard. There'd be a gallery, gallery, gallery around the sides, and you go through to the mosque. And look at those amazing towers on the mosque, octagons. Not round, not square, octagons. And as your eye travels up those two towers, it's almost as if you're looking at a series of carpets. It's fabrics. It's taking all that wonderful tile work and moving it from fabrics to, to buildings, to wood, <coughs> to leather. Decorating a building. And as it rises up, again, that great dome in the center, 130 feet high. 130 feet high. And the Kufic writing around the drum is 10 feet high. He's using Kufic writing, Arabic script, almost like a plastic art form. So not only we have tiles, but we're using, he's also using um, Arabic script as a decorative form. And it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. The next building that comes up about this time is called the Gore Emir, and this is Timur's tomb. But unfortunately, it wasn't supposed to be his tomb. It was really the tomb of his, his favorite grandson who died suddenly. And it was really um, rather, um, I think, a labor of love. This is the son, grandson he loved. And so it's not big and colossal. 
It's not overwhelming monumentality like his own personality. It's basically a labor of love. And we have an inscription, which I can't read, but I've been able to make out the name, and I think it's the name of the architect, Mahmoud al-Isfahani. Isfahani. So he has bringing from Persia some great, great architects and tile makers. And this tiny little mausoleum is probably has the most beautiful, beautiful tile work I've ever come across. And the entrance, as we say, is small. And as you see the rest of the building, there we go into, and underneath the double dome is where the, that's where the centotuphs are inside the building. And it's that wonderful dome. We now have a dome that's ribbed. There are 64 ribs around, and each one of those ribs have mosaic tiles. Mosaic tiles. That must have taken, I mean, it took three years to build, but how many men worked on just doing that dome? And again, the great drum underneath, pushing up that dome so that as you come into the city, you see domes. And there is the dome, 10 foot high, Kufic writing on the bottom. God is immortal, and so he is. And internally, it's just as overwhelming as externally because he used gold and blues and colors to make sure that this was a monument of remembrance to a lovely young man. And it wasn't just Timur building big buildings. Some of his, um, some of his princesses and some of his ladies also built buildings. And here we have the Shah and Zinda. The Shah and Zinda is a ne necropolis. It's a tiny little place. It has tiny little mausoleums of exquisite beauty. And you can actually see the tile work as you go through the Shah and Zinda and look at individual buildings on the way up. There are 26 tombs here. And each tomb has geometric tile work on it. Melon-shaped domes, turquoise, royal blue, gold mosaics, filigree columns. They sparkle as you go up. And as you walk up, you see building upon building of fantastic tile work, domes inside, outside. Wonderful ideas that people took. They put, they put Kufic writing into ribbons and made ribbons around the whole uh, pistak, that, that frontal portal. There are stalactites that hang and drip full of, full of wonderful mosaic tiles. And all around the band there is, again, the use of Arabic writing as a decorative form. And it's like ribbons of, it's like columns of ribbons, each one different, and you, can, you put it together, you think, this could be a complete mishmash, but it is not. Somehow it works. Somehow the great tile makers who tiled it inside and out made it work. And of course, you can't leave Samarkand without going to the Registan. Now, the Registan. People look at this and think, it's the noblest, well, this is Lord, Lord Curzon said, this is the noblest square in the world. Actually, when Timor was here, it was six roads that crossed, and it was a great bazaar. It was a great marketplace, because Timor knew that in order to build his buildings, he needed money. If he needed money, he's going to make sure those caravans still ran through the Silk Road. He needed the money. When he died, his great-grandson, Ulubeg, the great astronomer, took down the um, marketplace and built instead a madrasa, an Islamic school, a mosque, and a, um, a kanaka for visiting holy men, like a hostel. And we have the very early building here, which is Ulu Beg, the, the building on the left. That's the earliest building. It's a bit lower. And he was the first. <clears throat> and then later on in the 17th century, it was taken down, and two other madrasas were built. And one of them 
you'll see downstairs on the wall of, uh, up in the gallery and, um, with Marion's collection. And these are monochrome tile works that were expanded about this time. And I'll just show this one, the 17th century. We no longer have just blue and turquoise and white. Other colors are coming in. And we still have the ribbed dome. But we have different other things are happening. We have these uh, figures on the outside. The figures on the outside are interesting because people always say we're not supposed to put figures on the outside of a religious building in Islamic religious buildings, but you could, you can, if it's not a mosque. And of course, the artists here were from Persia, so they were Shia, and the Shia could have human faces on the outside of buildings. So this was a madrasa, and there's our human face looking out at us. Let's move on. Let's look at another city. Let's look at Bukhara. Now, Persians, Turks, and Uzbeks. Bukhara. Now, many people think of Bukhara as um, quite far from Samarkand. Well, it is. It's six days by camel. It's a bit quicker by coach. <clears throat> You can make it in a day. But like Samarkand, Bukhara was a city that was, had a mud brick wall 15 miles around, and it was also inhabited by Sogdians. And we know there were Sogdians there because the Sogdians were Zoroastrians and Buddhists, and they were very tolerant of different religions. And they left artifacts that were dug up in Bukhara. Now, it's quite interesting because many historians think that maybe Bukhara's name was actually a Buddhist name. Maybe it was from Bihara, Bihara, which was a Buddhist monastery. And those of you who know something about Samarkand and in the south in Afghanistan, there were lots of Buddhist monasteries all over this area. Very wealthy they were too. Very wealthy indeed. And the very first Arab general that came into Bukhara, supposedly he wrote and said, I burnt down the Zoroastrian fire, plate, uh, fire temple and I built a mosque. 1936, suddenly a building is discovered in Bukhara. Now if you look at this building, it looks a bit odd because to your right is another entrance. And that's where, they had, that's where they had the entrance to what they thought was the 16th century mosque. But 1936, they dug down and they found there was another entrance. And when they went into that building, they found there was scorch, scorched earth in the corner. It was where we think was a Zoroastrian temple that was burnt down. So on the Zoroastrian temple was built the first mosque, mud brick, mud brick. Little tiny bit of turquoise tile, but it's covered, those pillars are covered with symbols that are both Zoroastrian and Buddhist. So they're using symbols as a decorative art form. So when you go there, you can have a quick look inside and you will see things that look distinctly Zoroastrian. Distinctly. Things like this. These symbols here are very much Zoroastrian symbols. Up here, circles like chakris you find in the Buddhist, Buddhist um, monasteries. Lots of things are mixed together as art form. And there we have it. The very first building that was found. <clears throat> but this is the gem. This is my favorite building in all of Central Asia. And it is called the Samanid Mausoleum. A little bit of history. Bukhara, two great periods. First period was 10th century. Second period was about 15th century. Nothing much in between. 10th century. A Persian dynasty. A Persian dynasty comes up into Uzbekistan, 
and they take over quite a huge area, huge area. And they are accountants. They are bookkeepers. They want to ensure that the traders and the manufacturers of goods are excellent. They look after taxes, so they want to make sure that taxes are moderate, so people will, will um, trade through the area. They maintained all the old Sogdian links to China, Byzantium, Byzantium India, and up into Russia. They ensured that the commodities that they dealt with were of high value, and they were portable, refined tin, lead and copper, precious metals, sophisticated window glass, fine knives, elegant ceramics, silks, fine fabrics, and world-class paper. They were 10th century, and this is considered a mausoleum of the greatest of the uh, Samanas named Ishmael Samani. And it's breathtaking. It's a jewel. It's a perfect cube, has a low dome, and it's brick, basket brick work. It has four tiny domelets, <laughs> as I call them, that are very Sasanian. They all come from Persia. This is the Persian dynasty that is here. And it's covered with Sogdian ideas, and it's covered with Zoroastrian symbols and Buddhist symbols. So somehow, all this is being used in art form. Triangles, angels' wings, chhatris, bricks used in such a decorative way that every time you see this building, at a different time of the day, it looks different. All those little galleries at the top those four columns, all done with mud, with sun dry, uh, no, burnt brick. This is burnt brick. And that little tiny entrance hall that we see there, that little a door that goes in, is going to be blown up later on to become a pistak. Those Persian artists and architects are going to take that front and they're going to push it up, 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 as far as they can. And those columns are going to go up and up and turn into some of the great buildings that we see, we saw in Samarkand. And this is, this is the Samanids. And inside is just as exquisite as the outside. And you have to spend time here because this brick building is filled, filled with beauty, arches, and a little tiny dome that's gonna be pushed up and up and up and before we know it, it'll become the great domes of Samarkand. But the Samanids were also great patrons of culture. And they gathered some of the best minds in Central Asia. And they were scientists and mathematicians. And names that we call today, sometimes you read books and say the Arabs. Well, they weren't Arab. <laughs> they were Central Asians. Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina was there. And he came from Central Asia, the great doctor. And he went into Ishmael Samani's palace and said there was room upon room upon room of books. And I, he said, I read every book. Books I had never seen before. Books we have never seen before. He told us about them in great chests. One room was literature, one room was science, one room was astronomy, one room was astrology. Room upon room upon room of books collected by Ishmael Samani. And many of the other Arabs are also known from this part of the world. That was the Samanids, 10th century. Now I said there were two periods. The second period are the Shaibanids. Now many people don't know the word Shaibanid, but if you go to Uzbekistan and if you have a guide, he'll keep talking about Abdul Khan. Everyone calls about who's Abdullah Khan? Well, he was a Shaibanid. He was not a Timurid. Matter of fact, the Shaibanids were another Turkic group 
that literally kicked out Timur's ancestors south and later into India. And Timur's ancestors in India, Barbour, 15th century, was kicked out. And he ended up in Agra, not very happy, didn't like India very much. And, they, and later on, historians called them the Mughals, the Mughals. They would have turned over into a grave by being called Mughals, because to them, the Mughal was considered barbarians, disgusting, illiterate, uncouth. And here they are, called Mughals today. My goodness, wouldn't we like to change history? So the Shaibanans come in in the 16th century. They're Turkic speakers, they're nomadic, and we call them today um, Uzbeks. And they literally, literally, as I said, kicked out Timur's descendants into India. But they built some fantastic buildings. You may have been a barbarian, you may be a little bit illiterate, but you know how to do things well, because there's nothing like a nomadic people to learn completely quickly how to become cultured. And so they did. And Abdul Khan is a familiar name you'll hear when you go to Uzbekistan. And he pitched up here in the Ark. The Ark, this 18th century. But on this spot, there were many people who ruled Bukhara. Since we know probably 8th century AD, there was always somebody here at the Ark. Um, even the Bolsheviks tried to get rid of the Ark, but it didn't work. They just put a statue of uh, Lenin on the side. Anyway, they kept the Ark. They couldn't, they couldn't rip it down, but the Ark is there. But the Shaibanids knew they needed trade. They wanted to build a building. They wanted to gather merchants. They wanted to make the place zing. They wanted to become a cultured, nomadic, tribal group, or nomadic group. And Abdullah Khan unites all the Uzbek clan, clans, and he makes Bukhara his capital. And the Ark, of course, is the center of power. And again, it's all to do with trade. This is trade. This is part of the global highway. He knew he had to build the city up a bit. So he put in ponds, canals, places where people get water so they could have drinking water in, in their areas. We have this great duck pond. I wonder how much an MP paid for that one. Um, the streets were, were widened. They were made into streets where the caravans could come to. And all along the side of these streets, there were caravans. There were hostels for the merchants. There were bazaars that he built, all brick, brick buildings, so that your jewelers, your hat makers, your your uh, money changers would have a place they could do business. They'd be protected. They would be in a nice, semi-comfortable um, atmosphere. He made sure that they were cultivated and invited people to come here. Persian craftsmen and artisans came to Bukhara with the Shaibanids. But they were not like Timur. They didn't go conquering people. They actually had to pay for it. So it's quite expensive. When you go to Bukhara, though, you'll see this great complex called the Poi Kalan. <clears throat> there are three buildings here. But the three buildings are from three different periods. The first building is the minaret in the middle. Now, look at that minaret, because that minaret is built of brick. It's a brick building, and it's not Shaibanid. This is really quite early. This building goes back to the 11th century. It survived Genghis Khan. As a Samanid mausoleum survived, because it was just disappeared in the sand, so this minaret survived. And it's a fantastic brick building. It rises up. It was built in 1127. It rises up 170 feet. And it's decorated with bands of ge geometrical friezes. And each band is different. And there are Zoroastrian symbols. There are Buddhist symbols. All kinds. There's a little bit of Arabic writing up there saying, 
who built the minaret, and you go all the way to the top, and there's a little bit of tile, turquoise tile, way, way at the top, just below the lantern. The very first use of tile on an external building in Central Asia. Now we think these minarets, just to go back and take a look, those minarets may have had wooden lanterns at the top, and the minarets may have been used as a signal for the caravans coming from the desert. Makes sense. It also makes sense they probably burnt down quite a bit. So they started building the lanterns in brick. And if you look at minarets throughout the Islamic world, they're all different. There's probably like 30 different types of minarets. We do a couple of lectures just on minarets. But the minarets of Central Asia are pretty distinct. They almost stand separate from the mosque. And usually there's a stairway that goes from the minaret into the mosque. So that's the first building in this great complex. But the next two buildings are Shabanid buildings. <clears throat> and this is where the city starts taking shape. Because what they did here is to make sure that these buildings were here to promote the Shabanid culture. So the building to your right is the mosque. The building to the left is a madrasa. And in between, we have the wonderful 12th century minaret. This was the city that was taking place. There were 150 madrasas built. There were 200 district mosques, minarets, kanakas for holy men, and caravanserais. The Shabanids invited Persian workers, who were Shia, to come and do wonders with their buildings. And they did. They brought beautiful, beautiful tiles. They raised up that front, that pistak. They put tiles all over it. They brought more colors. They brought this great space. The four Iwans are coming in. The dome is rising again. The blue at the top and everything is rising up. You look at that madrasa across the way, we've got two double domes, two little domes there, and that pistak is going up, and it's almost like a, a riot of color, all done in mosaic tiles. It cost a fortune to build that madrasa. And look at the drum. The drum no longer just has Kufic letters, it now has almost a almost like it's a, um, looking at someone's home of art forms. Each, each section is a different form of tile work, lattice work. All around the, the top of that drum is um, wonderful Arabic writing, all done in mosaic tiles, tiny little pieces glued together, all weaving together, facing each other, other riots of color coming out of that. Ceilings. Ceilings were decorated. These people were bringing all different types of motifs. Flowers, dragons, birds, terracottas incised, ornaments, spherical designs, alabaster, carved wooden ceilings. And all this was coming because of trade and it was a flowering of really decorative and miniature art here in Samarkand, uh, Bukhara, in Uzbekistan. And to this day, there's a school in Bukhara that teaches young men how to paint miniatures, something to buy when you're there. <laughs> it's all fueled by Russian trade. And it was under these people, it was in this time here in, <clears throat> here in Bukhara, we have the last building you're going to see, is this lovely building which has on the front some interesting sort of Chinese Persian motifs. This dragon, this dragon that's sort of going up to the sun heaven with, the, with these lovely sort of arabesque vines going up the side. Notice the entry, it's rather large. And this, the question is, what was it built to be. 
Many people think that maybe it was first started to be as a caravanserai, because it looks like caravanserai inside, big space in the middle and places you can stay, <coughs> the merchants can stay around. And that possibly later, the builder decided that he should make a madrasa, because building madrasas and mosques um, when you're in later life means that you're probably going to get entry into heaven quite quickly. So anyway, it was enclosed a bit more and made into a madrasa school. And so this is the legacy that they left behind, which was art and architecture, brick buildings. And the next time you go to another timid country, the Mughal India, and you look at the Taj Mahal, what are you looking at? Here is the proof that we have the base of a Timurid building. A little bit, a lot of Indian influence, but that's art, and nothing else is completely new. Thank you. Should we take some questions? That was wonderful. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so I've got one much. last slide for Marion. Because this is the great collector, right? Oh, wait. wait. Oh, that's me. Oh, that's me. That's right. Me. Okay. okay. Don't more. There you are. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. I think that is Marion Bukhari. <laughs> Absolutely Buying wonderful. Some fabrics in a souk about 150 years ago. I think that's true. Thank you very much. I think so. I, I think, think we so. reincarnated. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Can we take some questions? Yes. Uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation. At the same time, you got a microphone. Right. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. At the same time that all of this was happening in what is Uzbekistan today. Yes. A lot of stuff were happening also in other parts in this region. In, in Iran, you had the Safavid period. Oh, absolutely. Period and so yes. Um, I, I'm curious. Um, you know, we like to sometimes think about this as a Renaissance uh, period um, for this particular region, in the same way that Renaissance in Europe yeah. brought about changes. Do you see a regional, um, um, regional play in terms of all of this wonderful architecture? What do you ask? You think what's what? Where, where did it start first? No, what not all? first. No, no. What, uh, what drove this regional? Um... What what made them do this? Yes. Okay, that's a good question. Very good question, and it's all speculation. Maybe it's because you live in the desert. Maybe you live in the desert and you want something beautiful around you, so you make colors. That could be part of it. Maybe the desert will throw up ideas of color on buildings. Timur built because he wanted monumentality. He wanted to show that he was the best thing and the greatest leader and the biggest empire of the world. So people build buildings and put their names on buildings because they want people to remember them. And I think that's probably just another idea. Where, why did they do this? The other big T we have today also builds big buildings, doesn't he? <laughs> They're pretty ugly, though. <laughs> They're not very exciting. <laughs> but that's, and, and where does it all come from? People always ask that, does, does, where does this start? Ideas are always flowing all over. They saw, they see ideas, the uh, Byzantium, Romans, Greeks, everyone had ideas. Everyone wanted to show something, to be cultured. To be cultured meant you had you had beautiful buildings, you had beautiful gods, you had beautiful fabric, that made you cultured. You had literature, you had writing. And that's what it's all about, it really is. Any other questions that we have? Okay. I heard a story about one of Timur's wives who allegedly built a mosque or ordered a mosque to be built and the architect fell in love with her and kissed her and left a mark on her face and then they all met a sticky end. Is there any truth in that story? Oh, no, no, but it's fun, it's a great story. There's a lovely yeah. story. <laughs> but that makes, that's what makes these buildings rather interesting. What is true is across from the Bibi Hanum uh, mosque, his, one of his wives did build another building. Yeah, yeah, there was another building. And he was really concerned that it was, might have been bigger than his. 
So he wanted the, the architect to go higher. So the Bibi Hanum is so big that as soon as it was built, it started crumbling. Matter of fact, it was a year after his death. Yes, Suzanne. Huh? Hi. <laughs> Here's our expert. <laughs> Thank you. I apologize for, for going back to the previous question, if I may. OK. And I think what was the point here, and I think you, you agree with me on this one, is that there is indeed a continuous tradition that is very much Timor arch art and architecture, all of which is not Timor himself, but all these people you noted so eloquently that he gathered and brought to mm. Samarkand and so forth, that many of these people are actually trained, have built in, say, central Iran or northwestern Iran or eastern Anatolia or Mesopotamia and Syria and so forth. So in other words, there is already a tradition of architecture and the arts to which he harks back and brings forward, and then of course, there is a development within the Timorid world, which by the way, I think you also agree with me on this one, includes all of Iran, essentially. Oh, sure. So That's this true. is, in a way, what we nowadays call Persianate world, which mm -hmm. is really the languages, the language, Persian languages, the high point, and so forth. So it's, I think that's the point, that this is uh, perhaps very much related to a competition with the past, uh, which is uh, to which he's an heir, actually, or mm. he conquers it, if you will. But, but that would be a really, uh, perhaps, a more reasonable way to think about it than uh, thinking that they just desired to do something because there was nothing in the desert. That's just a, and I know you, you, you do this sort of history anyhow. So I just thought I'd, I'd... It's sort of, as I always thought too, is like building a cathedral in Europe. You know, everyone would come. All your, all your artists would come because it was jobs going. And the names Isfahani or Tabrizi and that, maybe it was just names. You know, but they're, they're, I'm sure they were all over. They, all, they were coming from all over. Some brought and some not brought. <laughs> Right. We have one more, one more, one more, one or two more questions. We don't want to be here too, too late. Get a cup of tea afterwards. Thank you. And a biscuit. One, wonderful talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, I was just wondering about the, the minaret at Poi Kalan. And do you think that that might be a symbol of or resonate with the Tower of Babel? So you have this structure that's reaching towards heaven. And I wondered what other analysis or functions, uh, apart from the signals for the caravans? Uh, it, it Tower of Babel, long t ziggurats, going up to heaven, how far can you go, religious buildings, uh, lighthouses in the desert. I think people like building up, building higher and higher. I think they just like it. It just happens. But there's all big buildings all over the place. Let's have just one more so that we can... Oh, we got two more, that's it, okay. Then people can have a cup of tea, okay. Thank you very much for the lecture. I am, I am a student at SOAS here, and Good. I am from Samarkand myself, so it was lovely to hear about it. Um, <laughs> and my family is a very proud Samarkandi, and I just wanted to highlight that uh, currently Samarkand itself, and for history, um, it was a cosmopolitan city and currently it has a rich Tajik Uzbek population. And I think calling it just Uzbek and Uzbekistan kind of limits that unfortunate national division that is currently happening in yeah. Central Asia. Yeah. And there is a strong Tajik community, just to yeah. highlight, without any national interest. And it used to be just one big space where people just I go know. from place to place. Such a beauty, beautiful cosmopolitan. There's nothing like national, national, national boundaries to really ruin everything. Indeed. Anything. And yeah. I just wanted to ask really quickly about the uh, 21st century, the current renovation works that are happening in, Central, uh, in Samarkand itself. I heard a lot of criticism. Um, Robert Hillenbrand came a couple of years ago saying that it's really something to pain, very painful to watch yeah. um, how they're trying to add this extra grandiose to something that is grandiose by itself. And yeah. I was wondering what you thought about the current renovation project. Well, renovating buildings has always been controversial in all over the world. 
And the point is, this part of the world, they didn't have what we have, which is constantly keeping our buildings going. If we didn't have people constantly working on the Tower of London or on a cathedral, it'd probably crumble. So it crumbled. Earthquakes, you know, mud, uh, storms, things happened to buildings. And people didn't have the money to maintain them. But they're trying hard. And that's all right. It, they're trying. They are talking about, um, I don't know if it'll happen now, but Arc Sarai. They're going to rebuild the whole Arc Sarai. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's such a great idea. But anyway, we'll see what happens. But it's because leaving what they have is fabulous. Fabulous. OK? One more question. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks for a wonderful speech, and uh, the pictures are fabulous as well. Um, just, just one question, really. Um, I felt when I saw some of those internal designs, the sort of honey, honeycomb structures, it reminded me very much of the Alhambra in Spain. And I was just oh, wondering yes. yeah. how, I mean, is it just a coincidence, or might the designs have traveled somewhere from Central oh, Asia sure. all the way? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, designs, Alhambra, the stalactites, those mukhanas, definitely coming from, uh, the, coming from uh, the Levant through North Africa. I mean, ideas, ideas travel quickly. Just because we have internet today, we didn't think people could travel very quickly then. It, they traveled hugely quickly. Ideas always went with caravans. So, yes, ideas. Great ideas, and used differently. Right. Thank you very much, and see you in Samarkand. <laughs>